21st century Ireland, 5,000 people live behind bars. They inhabit a dangerous twilight world where drugs, violence, and chronic overcrowding are commonplace. Some of the physical conditions in our prisons are among the worst in Europe. We have people sleeping on floors, you have people sleeping in shower areas. Drugs are the scourge of Mount Joy and indeed every other prison as well. I've seen people shoot up hundreds of times. Prisoners are being blackmailed, prisoners are being threatened. I got stabbed four or five times in the back with a nail on a stick. For over 200 years, our prisons have held everyone from notorious murderers to Republican martyrs and nine-year-old petty thieves. This is the incredible story of our prisons, the murders and riots. It was the ruckliest time we ever had in prison. Someone wasn't killed. The hunger strikes. People have asked, you know, were you prepared today? And the answer is yes. The daring escapes. A guy stepped out of the chopper, masked, armalite. There was pandemonium. Events that have impacted far beyond the walls of these institutions. After those shots were fired, Irish history would never be the same. Few people will ever get to see what life is truly like inside our prisons. Cameras are rarely, if ever, admitted. But Mountjoy's governor has agreed to give us a rare glimpse inside the country's most notorious prison. First, I have to get through security. Airport-style scanning and sniffer dogs are deployed in an ongoing battle to keep contraband and drugs out of the jail. The basic problem on Mountjoy is that you have still a very high usage of illegal and legal drugs within the prison. We can certainly say that the uh, usage of opiates, methadone, or illegal opiates would be 80-90% of the prison population there. Rampant drug abuse is but one of the prison's many problems. Built in the 19th century, Mount Joy is a crumbling Victorian prison where inmates live cheek by jowl in overcrowded cells. Mount Joy is a keep. It's 150 years old stone building that has had no major refurbishment done to it in the 150 years. The first impression I have of Mount Joy after the gate was the smell. The smell and the stench of urine. And the last impression I have of Mount Joy leaving it 30 years later was the smell and the stench of urine. It's perhaps no wonder, given living conditions inside the jail. This is where prisoners spend most of their day. It's got an iron bed with a thin mattress. It's got a TV and a writing table. And prisoners are entitled to books, photographs, and writing material, and even computer games. But this prisoner is lucky. Up to a third of the Joy's inmates have to share a cell exactly like this with two other inmates. Well, what we're looking at is two prisoners in single cells. Um, on occasions as many as seven in some of the larger cells, which were designed for three or four people. We have people sleeping on floors, you have people sleeping in shower areas. The safe custody limit for Mount Joy would be 540, and you have as many as 700 there on a regular basis. People just don't understand the damage that's doing. They don't appreciate doubling up. A person having to share a small space with somebody who you're totally incompatible with, who's driving you crazy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not to mention the risk factors like of abuse, bullying, sexual abuse. There is no in-cell sanitation in the cells. Sanitation is done by prisoners using piss pots, pardon my French, and buckets, which they carry every morning to the end of the landing and throw into toilets or slop hoppers. Because of the lack of sanitation, there was problems with infestation. Rats. Man, we had whoppers up there. We used to have buttes and cockroaches. I was in a cell with two other people. You're talking down the three buckets. Then for each of us to go to the toilet in. And then if one has to go to number two, like, think how that'd be. I don't want to be here at nine o'clock and I wait three hours to try and go to the toilet, and then if I can't, I have to do it in a bit of newspaper, flatten it out and throw it out the window. That's the grain, like. 
Day-to-day -day life and the joy is run according to a strict, unchanging timetable. After breakfast, it's an hour's exercise, education, or work training. But facilities for education are basic, with places for only 140 of Mount Joy's 740 prisoners. At 12.15, the prisoners get their dinner, but there's no canteen. Instead, they return to their cells to eat. There might be classes after, and then it's lock-up time again until 5.30, when the prisoners get two hours recreation. At 10 o'clock, it's lights out. Anybody you'll speak to that's spent time in prison, that's honest, will tell you, you know, Mount Joy is a boring place. It's a place where you go crazy because we don't have adequate activities, resources, facilities, and adequate accommodation to accommodate the number of people who are dumped in there. When it was built over 160 years ago, Mount Joy was a model of its kind, a sophisticated, purpose-built jail designed to reform inmates. It was seen as a great leap forward in the treatment of criminals, because previously, penalties for criminals were much more severe than their offences warranted. We set out to uncover the harsh historical realities of crime and punishment, what happened to murderers, thieves and subversives over the last 250 years. Well, it might surprise us today, but to begin with, prisons weren't really about punishment at all. In the 18th century, our prisons mainly housed debtors, men and women who were locked up in squalid dungeons until they paid their creditors. Prisons until the 1780s and 1790s were just buildings. They were castles, they were towers, they were just old houses. They could be anything because there was no prison architecture. There were very few rules in prisons. Rapes, robberies, murders were committed with impunity, men mixed with women, there was no regulation. These were private enterprises. They weren't run by the government. If you were wealthy, you could bring in your wife, family, maid, prostitute, pigs, dog. You could rent half the prison for yourself if you could pay the warder. If you were poor and starving, you pretty much remain poor and starving in prison. Only a small number of convicted criminals were kept behind bars. Back then, the state had other, more grisly ways of punishing offenders. This punishment was always public and not very pretty. The varieties of corporal punishment that were applied included the pillory. Essentially, you're put in stocks in a public uh, arena, and the public could, if they so choose, demonstrate their disapproval by throwing rotten cabbages and rotten whatever at you, making your life pretty miserable. Branding was another one, where you uh, a hot poker would brand your hand. And then whipping. Whipping was probably the most common form of punishment, uh, where minor offences would have been punished by whipping for a mile down a road. You'd be tied to the back of a cart, your shirt taken off, and literally you'd just be whipped through the public place. It'd break the skin badly, and effectively, and then you, you, would, you could emphasise uh, the pain by putting salt on it. Some could receive as many as 500 lashes, which was essentially could be a death sentence. The harshest penalties for criminals included transportation to the American colonies, where they would have to start a new life, often as indentured slaves. The other was death. At least 242 people were executed in Dublin from 1780 to 1795. These gruesome events were the rock concerts of their day. Thousands would gather at the hanging tree here in St. Stephen's Green to jeer and shout at the hapless victims. This bloodthirsty spectacle was the perfect excuse for drinking and making merry. Public executions would have been scheduled to take place on market days so that there would be the maximum amount of people on the streets at the time. That was very pointed and very intentional. The more people that saw this spectacle, the better. <laughs> The standard hanging literally means that a rope is put around your neck and uh, you were strung up and you were remain in that position until you died by asphyxiation. The intention was that they would be executed very quickly, but sometimes they could be left there for over an hour strangling uh, in front of the public. One of the most celebrated Irish freedom fighters met his death in this horrible public fashion. 
Robert Emmett was tried and convicted for organizing a rebellion against British rule in Ireland. Now the government would make an example of him. As Emmett stood in the scaffold with a noose around his neck, the executioner asked him if he was ready. Twice he replied no. The executioner put the question a third time and then immediately kicked away the plank bearing Emmett's weight. He dangled from the rope, twitching and struggling violently until death took him. The executioner then cut down Emmett's body, laid it out on a table and decapitated it. It was said that the blood that streamed from the headless corpse was lapped up by dogs and pigs. For some, though, an even grislier death awaited them. The more sensationalist was to be hanged, drawn and quartered. You were hanged usually for a short period until you had perhaps briefly lost your senses. Uh, you were taken down, uh, laid out, and if you're a male, uh, <coughs> your privates were cut off, uh, you were disemboweled, your innards taken out, uh, could be burnt in front of your face if you were still alive by that stage, and then effectively you were quartered, which means that your body was divided into four quarters. Uh, your head was held up to the crowd who was present to indicate that you were well and truly dead. But these gruesome scenes would soon be a thing of the past. People became more aware that, you know, of their own rights and the capital punishment was, it was an offence against the body. So there was a very strong move against capital punishment uh, by the end of the late 18th century. Ireland's other means of dealing with criminals, transportation, also faced a crisis. When America declared independence in 1776, the new country was no longer willing to take in Ireland's criminal class. The authorities were forced to rethink the role of prisons. Instead of whipping or executing offenders, why not lock them up instead? Once inside, perhaps they would repent and eventually become law-abiding citizens. This idea would revolutionize the Irish penal system. Across the country, new prisons were built. By 1800, every county and city had its own jail. The prison population boomed from around 1500 and 1787 to over 13,000 just 30 years later. One of these new prisons will become the most notorious and iconic in our history, Kilmainham Jail. Every prisoner who's entered Kilmainham since its doors opened in 1796 has been greeted with a forbidding sight. Five snarling dragons representing the felonies of murder, rape, theft, piracy and treason. The West Wing is the oldest and grimmest part of the prison. It's 79 cells opening onto dark, ominous corridors which have held some of Ireland's most celebrated revolutionary leaders. The prisoners were held in these tiny cells with no light, heating, or even glass in the windows. It was thought that the cold air whistling through the corridors would cleanse the souls of the inmates. The idea of the cell initially was to stop disease because prisoners were all thrown together prior to that. Jail fever, which was basically epidemic typhus, which was transferred by body lice from prisoner to prisoner, could be stopped by cell walls. The East Wing is the newest and most recognisable part of the prison. It was built according to the classic Victorian idea of the panopticon, our all-seeing eye. From this inner compound, the governor could observe all 96 cells and their occupants at any time. This is the, the register of prisoners in Kilmainham Jail in 1843, and it shows the range of prisoners from male adults, from females, uh, but unfortunately it also shows the large number of child prisoners uh, who were held here in Kilmainham Jail. Um, Ellen Murphy here, uh, she's aged 10 when she's uh, imprisoned in Kilmainham Jail for the terrible crime of stealing two shirts and a gown. She was sentenced to 14 days imprisonment and with hard labour. There's a nine-year-old here, uh, Richard Riley, for stealing fruits from a garden, a sentence of 14 days imprisonment or payment of a fine. 
That's extraordinary. Yeah. One of the more shocking cases that we're aware of in relation to child prisoners uh, was in 1839 when a little girl called Alicia Kelly, uh, she was just eight years old when she received a sentence of five months with hard labor uh, for stealing a gown. For women and children, hard labor involved working in the laundry. For men, it was a slog of breaking stone in the stonebreaker's yard are being forced to operate the dreaded tread wheel. The tread wheel was basically like a massive water wheel with wooden struts going across, but instead of using water to turn this wheel, you use humans. And they stand up, hold a bar, and push down on the struts of this massive wheel. The tread wheel's back-breaking work. You would have worked in eight-hour shifts. Sometimes it would be used to grind corn in a prison or draw water up from a well, but other times the only purpose was to make the prisoner make this wheel go round. Between rock breaking and the tread wheel, uh, prisoners would have been very emaciated by the time they left prison. We would regard them as appalling conditions, but there was an argument at the time that the conditions were too comfortable for prisoners. Come on, stay strong now. Keep pushing hard. Let's go. Today, the authorities face the same accusation that inmates live a cushy lifestyle, all paid for by the state. The average cost of keeping a prisoner in jail today is 79,000 euro a year. The Midlands prison here, and when you go around the prison, you'll find it, it's extremely bright, cheerful, clean. The prisoners are happy enough to be here. They, they're out to get on their sentence. There's enough here from, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day to occupy their time. Here, inmates have access to educational facilities, providing metalwork, woodwork, pottery, and art courses. And there's even a gymnasium offering a range of fitness classes, everything from yoga to boxing. It would be wrong to say that people are living in inhumane conditions. That's not true. The quality of the average Irish prison has dramatically improved. We run pictures all the time of murderers and killers sitting in their cells, watching their flat screen TVs, drinking wine and getting stoned out of their loaves, having a good crack, and on the, they're sending out pictures on their mobile phone to their girlfriends. I suppose when you go around like, the likes of the prison here today, and you, people would think maybe it is a bit, a bit like a holiday camp, um, but one, they're not. They're incarcerated. They've lost their liberty. That's the start of it. It's not nice for anybody to take away from their families and their loved ones outside, no matter what crime they've done. They have to come in and, and, and get on with it and do it as best they can. I'm not going to make their life any harder. Having the right connections and cash has always made a difference to life behind bars. When Charles Stuart Parnell was jailed during the land war of the 1880s, he was held here in this spacious room in Kilmainham. He dined lavishly, feasting on oysters, fine wines, joints of meat and hot whiskies. It's even said he received breakfast in bed. It was great for Parnell. He had a lovely room, a uh, fireplace, he could be visited whenever he wanted. Uh, his food was amazing and he had conditions that most prisoners uh, who were imprisoned in Ireland in the 19th century could only dream of. Ordinary prisoners survived on a diet of stirabout, a thin gruel of oats and water along with bread and potatoes. Just a decade after opening, one prisoner in Kilmainham described wading up to his ankles in human excrement and having to eat putrid flesh served from a filthy table. Then in 1845, famine struck. The famine was horrific in Kilmainham jail. You can just, uh, no, in fact, we cannot imagine the overcrowding. The prison population exploded as jail swelled with men, women and children. In 1850, over 9,000 prisoners were crammed into less than 200 cells here in Kilmainham. Tragically, most were simply breaking the law in the hope of being placed in prison simply to stay alive. People would have tried to commit small crimes in order to be put into Kilmainham to get the food that the prisoners would have had. So you had people committing a lot of food-related crimes, stealing greens from a garden, onions from a field, being in possession of stolen potatoes, um, attacking a bread cart. For some offenders, worse was to come. They were sentenced to hard labor on Spike Island. Instead of people saying as they do today, I'll end up in Mount Joy, it was, I will end up in Spike Island. It became the great presence in the harbor where these allegedly evil people are, are kept. 
Spike Island was the last stop for criminals before exile on prison ships to Van Diemen's land, present-day Tasmania. But bad and all as transportation on a stinking prison ship to the other side of the world was, conditions on Spike were so bad and so dangerous that many would end their days here. What were conditions like for the convicts when they first came here? In the first number of years, they were extremely overcrowded. In 1854, the prison should have about 1,200 prisoners. It was accommodating more than 2,000 at that stage. At least 800 were deemed unfit for any kind of labor. Too ill, too unwell. Too broken down, I think, is the term that was used. From 7 in the morning until 6 at night, the prisoners, some as young as 10, were employed moving the massive outcrops of rock that littered the island. Now, that means moving huge amounts of earth. Prisoners doing the work of horses, I think, was, was a term that was used. So life was pretty brutal. Life oh, was yeah, pretty... from 1847 to 1854, something like 940 prisoners die. That would clearly indicate, to me at least, that it is the care, the food, the working conditions are actually killing prisoners. It's difficult to avoid that, that conclusion. Today, the bodies of over a 1,000 men and boys lie buried in a mass grave here on the island. In 1852 alone, 190 men lost their lives breaking stone or simply dying of starvation. Locals say the spirits of the dead still haunt this island, and is it any wonder, considering the torment of their lives? Coming up, solitary confinement for two years. The extraordinary story of one prisoner's brutal ordeal and how three men convicted of capital murder in the 1980s ended up on death row in Port Leash Prison. This week on Midweek, we hear one woman's shocking story of how she spent six days on a trolley waiting to be treated at her local hospital and ask how long will we have to endure these conditions and what is our government doing about it? My Hospital Hell, midweek this Wednesday at 10 on 3. So, will you ever show me your soft side? Yeah. soft side is irresistible use it an irresistible soft caramel heart running through a delicious chocolate ice cream new cornetto enigma the colgate 360 surround fully operational doctor perfect your mission is to clean more than just teeth use your surround clean bristles to target bacteria on both sides you're designed to remove bacteria in three ways bacteria beware colgate 360 surround cleans more than just teeth when you come home, are you greeted by annoying odours? Time for new Febreze Set and Refresh to show odours the door for 30 days. Set and Refresh gradually releases scented oils to eliminate odours, leaving a light, fresh scent so you can enjoy 30 days of continuous freshness. Still fresh. And the easy refill lets you enjoy another 30 days of freshness. Discover new Febreze Set and Refresh. The Solitary Man Returns. Neil Diamond, live with special guest Mary Bird. An incredible night filled with all those Neil Diamond favorites. Neil Diamond, live with special guest Mary Bird. Tickets on sale now. We believe keeping kids healthy starts with their hands. And when they wash them, the last thing they need to touch is a germy pump. Try the Dettol No-Touch Hand Wash System. It senses hands automatically and dispenses soap that kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. No more germy pump. So hygienic hands are automatic. For healthy tips and more, visit Dettol.ie slash Mission for Health. We all know Pooh has a rumbly in his tumbly, but you might not know special fairy laundry packs offer a free Disney Winnie the Pooh audiobook. Now everyone knows everything about everything.
Just like you, at Kenko, we want to use less packaging. So we tried 100% less packaging. But in the end, we settled for 97% less. The Kenko Eco Refill Pack was 97% less packaging. Get it! change in prisoners in my time was that they became more aggressive and they became more violent. Prisons are about warehousing people who are a danger to society. But who has to look after them and monitor them for the rest of their lives? Prison officers. Of the country's 5,000 prisoners, a small number pose such a serious threat that they have to be confined in separate areas. One such prisoner is Leroy Dumbrell. Dumbrell has racked up 60 convictions, one for stabbing a 20-year-old woman who was suffering from multiple sclerosis and then setting her on fire. Jail for eight years, Dumbrell was then involved in a riot in Mount Joy when one prisoner was stabbed five times. Prisoners who step out of line can expect to have privileges withdrawn, such as visiting rights, but Dumbrell faced the ultimate sanction, solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is still allowed under the prison rules as a sanction with regard to prisoners who break prison discipline. There are certain cells that have been set aside by the prison system as punishment cells for that purpose. So that would mean people that would be in a completely closed space would have no contact with other prisoners or indeed physical contact with staff. And that might be over an extended period of time. In fact, Leroy Dumbrell was to spend six months in solitary confinement in Castlery Prison. Dumbrell took his case to the High Court, challenging the regime under which he was being held. He won his case. But solitary confinement is still being used as a punishment inside our prisons. We do know that prisoners are routinely subjected to solitary confinement type punishments. One can imagine that that could very well exacerbate mental health or other issues a prisoner might have. Back in 1993, Seamus O'Brien was serving an eight-year sentence on Spike Island for his part in a botched robbery and kidnapping. A restless and troubled 19-year-old, he was involved in a protest which culminated in a rooftop standoff with prison guards. Three of us ended up on top of the roof, so we just started pulling slates off and, you know, we just done ball things now. So eventually we know where to go, like, so we came down and... Yeah, we just punished him for this. I was kept in uh, solitary confinement for three days, and in three days, then you're not left out at all. Just seeing your underwear, that's it. They say it's to be quietly down. They put you out of the way, keep you out of people's way, um, to stop you from harming others, which is, you know, it's, it's reasonable. But the things that happen in between, then, like, don't make sense at all. Like, you know, it's all mind games. This place is all run by my big fans, very noisy fans. They blow the fans like late at night and all that, so they don't get to sleep to keep you awake. All the floors and the concrete beds would be all wet. They'd bucket the water and before, they, before they put you in there and stuff. And then you can imagine just being in there in your underwear. And they might fling the food into you, then, like you look at your food and there's, you know, God only knows what's inside in this. You don't know all the time, so you be just walking around the cell, doing all exercising, push-ups and walls a day, trying to tire yourself out, just to kind of, you know, trying to beat that, like, you know, trying to kind of... But then sometimes you just get you, like, you know.
Back when Mount Joy was built, this was the way every prisoner lived. In fact, the Joy was designed with isolation very much in mind. Prisoners were expected to remain silent and not even speak to other prisoners. In effect, it amounted to mass solitary confinement. After a year of such treatment, it's hardly surprising that some prisoners went insane. Silence was the number one rule in prisons for half a century in the 19th century. Silent separation is what they called it. Prisoners were held in their cells for 23 hours a day. Everything in their cell was built around the fact that they could be held there. There was a handle to call a warder. There was a window. There was heating. There was a toilet. There was a hatch through in the door through which food could be passed. And the idea was that, and as one prison reformer says, the walls of the prison will preach to the prisoner's soul and he will confess the wisdom of his maker and the justness of the laws of his country and then leave prison a better person. An alternative to that was you went mad because you were kept silent for your entire prison sentence. The prison doctor called life in Manchoy an ordeal for body and mind. In these circumstances, a visit from the chaplain could reduce even the most hardened offender to tears. Eventually, Manjoy's system of silence and isolation was ditched. But solitary confinement would continue to be used to keep prisoners in line. We've all heard the horror stories about solitary in prisons, from Alcatraz to Devil's Island. But Ireland has a case to rival the very worst. In 1946, it caused a huge public scandal, but today it's virtually unknown. And it remains one of the most shocking abuses of power ever recorded in our prisons. The man at the center of this case was Sean McCaughey. In 1941, McCaughey was found guilty of beating and torturing a fellow IRA operative who was suspected of being an informer. He was sentenced to death. McCaughey's sentence was commuted to penal servitude for life, which he would serve in Port Leash Prison. When he refused to wear the prison uniform, he was placed in solitary confinement with only a blanket to cover himself. It was September 1941. McCaughey wasn't allowed out in the fresh air again until 1946. It's hard to imagine the mental and physical anguish McCaughey was forced to endure. Deprived of fresh air and sunshine, his only human contact was with the prison officers who delivered his food. It's alleged that warders fitted rubber soles to their shoes to maximize sensory deprivation. And cells either side of McCaughey's were left vacant, heightening the sense of absolute isolation. Sean McBride, a former IRA chief of staff, who was later awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his human rights work, took up McCaughey's case. McBride's former secretary, Katrina Lawler, has given us access to the McCaughey papers, which also feature correspondence about fellow IRA inmate Tomas McCurtain. This is a Sean McBride letter to one of the newspaper editors dated June 1946. I have ascertained from released prisoner that the exact continuous period of solitary confinement undergone by Sean McCaughey was 21 months and in the case of McCurtain was 32 months. They were not allowed in the fresh air for approximately four and a half and five and a half years respectively. If you look at this document here, um, at least three times per week warders would enter the cells of Republican prisoners and force them to get out of bed and to stand bare naked on the floor of the cell and then proceed with the most degrading and humiliating search of their bodies. The alleged purpose of this humiliating body search was to discover weapons. Unnecessary. Because, of course, they wouldn't leave their cells, certainly in McCaughey's case. No. So mm -hmm. how could he secrete weapons anywhere? So the purpose was clearly just to degrade and humiliate. Degrade and humiliate, yes. From the time he entered until the time his emaciated body was covered by a Franciscan habit on his death, he was naked except for the prison blanket. McBride pleaded with the government to intervene, but nothing was done. Eventually, McCaughey went on hunger strike and soon afterwards started refusing water. After 22 days, he was dead. At the inquest into his death, McCaughey's story burst into public view. The prison doctor, Dr. Duan, was asked by Sean McBride at the inquest, would he treat one of his dogs in that fashion? the way in which the prisoner had been treated and Dr. Duane had to say no. And that caused great consternation again in the country and in the courtroom. McCaughey's funeral drew thousands onto the streets of Dublin. 
His coffin, clad in a tricolour, was taken by procession to Belfast, where he was buried in Milltown Cemetery. What did Sean McBride say to you? How did he take his death? As with every death, with great sadness and emotion, every death diminishes us of those people who were treated badly. Coming up, how three convicted killers found themselves on death row in the 1980s. Death by firing squad in a bleak prison yard. How the executions of Pierce, Connolly, and the men of 1916 changed Ireland forever. Hi, you're through to Shane at 123.ie. Yes, that's right, we're based in Dublin. Yes, that's comprehensive car insurance from only 250 euro. Yes, it includes breakdown assistance and windscreen cover and full no claims bonus protection. Woo! Great! I can sign you up now for comprehensive car insurance from just 250 euro or you can visit 123.ie. Just log on and save money. Call 1890 400 123. with essential oils. Long-lasting, best-ever fragrances from Surf. Excuse me, is your toothpaste working? Yeah, of course. Time for a quick check. OK. This shows the high bacteria levels in your mouth which affect its health. But honestly, I brushed this morning. Not with new Colgate Total. Only Colgate Total Advanced offers non-stop protection against bacteria that's clinically proven. So your mouth stays healthier. Try it and come back tomorrow. Hello again. Did you brush with Colgate Total? You tell me. Now have a look. Wow. My mouth is healthier overnight. I'm impressed. New Colgate Total Advanced. Non-stop protection for a healthier mouth. I am a the solitary man returns. Neil Diamond, live with special guest Mary Bird. An incredible night filled with all those Neil Diamond favourites. Neil Diamond, live with special guest Mary Bird. Tickets on sale now. Drive the all-new Nissan Micra at your local Nissan dealer or visit nissan.ie for further details. Nestle cereals taste so good, it's easy to forget they have whole grain. That's why we've put the green banner on every one. So you can be sure they're getting whole grain in every delicious bite. Nestle cereals. Whole grain, wholly delicious. Specsavers, there's 50% off eye tests until the 31st of July. <laughs> New Chocolate Loco from HB Hazelbrook Farm. A crazy, swirly, yummy vanilla and chocolate ice cream with lots of chocolate cookies. Are you loco for new Chocola Loco? HP Hazelbrook Farm, making the most of milk. We found our golden couple, Matthew and Gwonya, so now it's your chance to plan their wedding. TV3 has teamed up with goldenpages.ie to give you the chance to win a gold bar worth €30,000. All you have to do is log on to goldenpages.ie and complete our seven challenges, including finding transport, the venue and catering, a gift for guests, the photographer, the music, clothing, hair and makeup, and the honeymoon. Give a wedding your golden touch with TV3 and goldenpages.ie.
In many countries, murder and other offences still carry a sentence of death. Last year, 546 people were executed in Iran for crimes ranging from drug offences to murder to immoral acts. In the United States, there are over 3,000 prisoners on death row, hoping for a reprieve to save them from a sentence of lethal injection. It's over half a century since the last execution in this country, but up until 1990, the murder of a member of the Gardaí or prison service carried the ultimate sanction of death. And in 1980, three men found themselves on death row here in Port Leash after a robbery in Balahadreen, County Roscommon, went badly wrong. On July 7th, 1980, three armed and masked men raided the town's Bank of Ireland and left with £41,000. When their getaway car was intercepted by Gardaí, one of the raiders jumped out and sprayed the patrol car with bullets, instantly killing Garda Henry Byrne. During a further exchange of gunfire, Detective John Morley was also fatally wounded. Both men were married with children, and their deaths caused public outrage. The three alleged raiders, Peter Pringle, Patrick McCann, and Colm O'Shea, were captured and sent for trial here at the Special Criminal Court in Dublin. On November 27th, 1980, a packed court waited to hear the verdicts. McCann, Pringle and O'Shea stood in the dock as the judges filed in. The Chief Justice delivered the verdict. The men were guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. In the public gallery, there was a hushed silence. In the dock, two of the men smiled and whispered to each other. The death sentence can, of course, be appealed to a higher court. If such an appeal fails, then it's up to the government. They can advise the president to commute the sentence to penal servitude for life, or they can decide to let the law take its course. Their executions were fixed for the 19th of December, 1980, less than three weeks away. The convicted killers would spend their final days on death row in Port Leash Prison. Prison officer Noel Tuhi was assigned to guard them. Not long after that, there was a guard who murdered in Wexford, and there was, there was a guy arrested for that. So four eventually we had charged with capital murder and found guilty and sentenced to hang. Part of their conditions was that they had to be kept uh, away from the other prisoners, they had to be kept in isolation. But also part of it was the two officers had to watch them 24 hours a day. You had four guys sleeping in the one cell, and you had eight officers in there as well. But eventually they moved the officers out so you could observe them from a separate room. And also tradition was that they got one bottle of Guinness a night. Now, whether they kept it for two nights and had a real old sing song, I don't know. Pringle, McCann and O'Shea appealed their sentences and got a stay of execution. But six months later, the Court of Criminal Appeal rejected their cases and set a new date for the execution, the 8th of June, 1981. The shadow of the noose still hung over them. There are no tensions rose. You can imagine four people living in, in one room, four men living in one room, with no contact with their, their comrades or their friends or anything else, you know what I mean? It was, it, it, got, it got very tense at times. It didn't mean anything to us at the time, because that's what you did. You're a prison officer, brought to prison, you keep men, and that's what you did. Five days after the second sentence of death, President Patrick Hillary commuted the sentences to 40 years penal servitude with no chance of parole. In 1995, Pringle's conviction was overturned and he was released. McCann and O'Shea are still serving their time in Port Leash Prison. We never believed that they were actually going to carry out the sentence, but for a long, long time that was the situation in Port Leash Prison, so I can actually say I was on death row with prisoners. In 1990, capital punishment was taken off the statute books and death row was abolished. Just watch your step, please. It's quite dangerous. Just the last man summer. to hang in Ireland was Michael Manning in April 1954. A high house. Yes. Wow. This is where he died, Mountjoy's Hanghouse, where museum curator and former prison officer Sean Reynolds has preserved the hangman's tools of the trade. So, Sean, how many people were killed here? Well, actually, a man that was executed in this particular room was about 36. Yeah. In total, from 1901 to 1954, 49 were executed in Mountjoy. This is the, the rope that done the deed. But this rope? This rope would actually life. have taken a person's life. Because as you can see here, from the brass ring out to the pack thread, which is here, is an, an average of 13 inches. 
that's the, when your neck is constricted by the rope, that's what it will constrict to. So for the execution to be effective, they had to go to the table of drops. The table of drops was used to calculate the length of rope needed to hang the victim and had been introduced in the late 19th century after a number of executions went badly wrong. Now the executions will be in the hands of professionals. After independence, the state used the services of British hangmen, first John Ellis, and later three members of the Pierpoint family, Thomas, his brother Henry, and Henry's son Albert. All three Pierpoints used the title of Britain's number one executioner. Was there always a set time for the hanging? Eight o'clock. Always eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. At eight o'clock, the executioner went to the condemned cell, which was just outside the door here on the left-hand side. The executioner had that strap in his hand. That strap has a double buckle. So Albert Pierpoint would take his wrist and he would strap it on and he would take it around his back and he would use a second buckle. Pierpoint then would leave the condemned cell and he would walk straight in front, straight in here and he would have his back to the crucifixes on the wall. When the man came through, he was put on the platform. On the trapdoor here, he would have a position marked with a piece of chalk and that was in, in the shape of a T and that's where he wanted the condemned man to hang. This hood was placed over the prison hole in your hand there. That hood was placed over the prisoner's head. Then that noose, that brass noose here, was positioned here. The assistant executioners would proceed to strap your legs with that. The executioner proceeds to the lever. This is the lever here that will release the doors. The man is standing on the, on the trap door. Lever is shoved forward. And that is the last sound that the individual will hear. And how long will they hear that? Is it a quarter of a second? A quarter of a second, they reckon that the individual will be dead. The second and third vertebrae are automatically snapped. So death is instantaneous. From coming in that door there, how soon is it before the man is killed? About eight to nine seconds. It has been said that Albert Pierpoint has said after an execution that he had better than his father's record. And what was his father's record? His father's record could be maybe 10, 11 seconds. He had done it in about seven and a half seconds. Were they racing to kill the men? Why was it? Speed. It was all to do with speed. Also, it has been said too that Albert smoked a cigar. Before he left that condemned cell, he took a drag from his cigar. He left the cigar down. Between hanging the man and got back out again, the ash would not have fallen off that cigar. And what kind of toll did this take on the mind of the hangman? Because obviously, if it was your profession to kill people. Well, it, it took a large toll on, on John Ellis because John Ellis retired at public execution number one about 1922, 23 stroke. And he, he tried to commit suicide shortly after retiring by putting a revolver in his mouth and pulling the trigger. But it didn't work, the bullet came out, and John Ellis lived for another, possibly another 10 years. He was a barber, and in 1932, it all came too much for him. And he ran a muck in his barber shop got an open razor, and he cut his own throat. Back before independence under British rule, there was a crime far worse than murder or larceny, treason. The cells and corridors of Kilmainham Jail and Mountjoy are haunted with the spirits of the men and women who died in the name of Irish freedom. And it was here in Kilmainham that the most celebrated of them all, Podrick Pierce, Thomas McDonough, Eamon Kent, and others, would spend their final hours. They were taken here after their failed attempt to overthrow British rule in Ireland, the 1916 Rising. On the steps of the GPO, they proclaimed an Irish Republic, and then all hell broke loose. Days of shootings, bombings, and street fighting followed before the men surrendered. They were tried and sentenced to death. In the cells along this corridor in Kilmainham's old Georgian wing, the signatories of the 1916 proclamation would spend their final hours. They would have left last letters. The letters are wonderful because they vary from very noble, very dignified letters saying, I did what I did for Ireland. Other ones, like Michael Malin, for instance, at certain stages he has no punctuation, no paragraphs. He starts to write about his children, and when he gets to little Joseph, he just puts, Joseph, my little man, my little man. His letter is a very moving, wonderful human document. 
If you get the chance to walk down those corridors that a lot of the leaders would have walked down on their last walk from their cells to the Stonebreaker's yard where they were executed, it's very, very evocative. The priest would have been with them. The soldiers would have taken them from the cells. They would have been handcuffed in the cells and guided down through those corridors out into the Stonebreaker's yard. In this small enclosed space with its 30-foot high blank walls, no one would witness the executions. One by one, between the 3rd and the 12th of May, 1916, the men were led in here. They were blindfolded. A white piece of paper was placed over their heart. Death would be swift. Then the, the firing squad would line up, six kneeling and six standing, and of the 12 rifles, um, one had a blank. And when the soldiers walked in, they were handed the rifles, so none of the soldiers knew which of them had the blank. Podrick Pierce was the first to die. In his final letter to his mother, written on the eve of his execution, he wrote, this is the death I should have asked for if God had given me the choice of all deaths, to die a soldier's death for Ireland and for freedom. We have done right. James Connolly was too badly injured to stand and was shot tied to a wooden chair. When asked to pray for the men who were about to shoot him, he said, I will say a prayer for all brave men who do their duty according to their lights. I mean, it is a very poignant place, whether you believe in ghosts, political or otherwise, it is a very poignant place to see the two crosses at either end, one where Connolly was executed and the other where the others were executed. The men and women who were in Kilmainham in May 1916, every single one of them, mention this horrendous, awful noise, this volley of shots breaking out at dawn. They knew what was happening, but can you imagine, you hear the shots, you know somebody has been executed, and you don't know who. But every one of them mentioned the shots at dawn. In all, 14 men died in this bleak and soulless pit in the weeks following 1916. Their legacy would be a controversial one. For some, 1916 was the founding moment of a free Ireland. For others, an act of treachery that would place the gun at the heart of Irish politics for years to come. What is indisputable is that this event would become one of the most dramatic single moments in Irish history. Literally, you know, after those shots were fired in this place, Irish history would never be the same. As Yates said, Ireland had changed utterly. Those executions, the shots which rang around the, the, the Stonebreaker's Yard of Kilmainham literally rang around the country, rang around throughout Irish history. And from that moment, prisons have become a very central part in the psychology of the Irish person. You know, whatever happened before that and after that, those days in May, those dawns in May, transformed Irish history, transformed the Irish psyche and transformed Irish politics. Nothing was the same afterwards. Thank <laughs> you.